You're listening to Popstar Conversations, taking you inside with your favourite musical artists. Chuck and I will be sitting here with the incredibly talented Adele. Adele, welcome to our show. Thank you. Adele, welcome. What makes this album, 21, so different from your first album, 19? Well, I knew from when I was still promoting my first album that I definitely still wanted to progress a bit with, with my second record. And I didn't know how much I wanted to. I knew that I wanted to go down a bit more of a bluesier, gospel kind of route um, and be a bit more kind of playful and cheeky and, and kind of sarcastic. But I didn't want to stray too far, obviously, because my fans who enjoyed Chasing Pavements and Hometown Glory and songs like that so much of the first record you know i didn't want to lose them i didn't want to alienate them or anything so um i was quite i struggled for a few months to work out what kind of sound i wanted to go for but also you know the first record i come across really serious you know and i actually actually really like trying to be funny and having a laugh and acting you know like like a young woman rather than like an old person (laughs) you know so um i knew those are two key things that i wanted to change and i wanted a few upbeat songs as well adele we had just listened to your single chasing pavement that was off of your first album. Would you agree that the new album has a lot of Chasing Pavement moments in it? Fire to the Rain's a little bit of a Chasing Pavement, isn't it? Yeah, my best friend, my gay best friend, he was like, when are you going to write me a gay anthem? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'll have a go. So then I come up with the title set, Fire to the Rain, and you can't really get much camper than that. So would you say it's still about love and relationships? Are you approaching it from different angles and is talking about letting go, being hurt? Yeah. Are these first-hand experiences, or uh, are you just playing roles? No, no, it's all, yeah, my experience, yeah, again. Yeah, it doesn't change when you are successful in your career. It doesn't change at home at all. If anything, it gets worse. But, um, yeah, no, it's about the same things. It's not about the same person. I don't like recycling old loves. Yeah, it's about, it's it's pretty much the same subject, except that, you know, it was my first proper adult relationship that this record's about. It was, like, proper commitment, you know, like, like money and everything, sharing absolutely everything in our lives which was my first time of doing that and I, I am more mature in relationships especially more mature in my last relationship than I was in the relationship of 19 and I realized <laughs> for the first time which is something that comes of age so appropriately that's why I called the album 21 is that I'm actually not that great a girlfriend and I used to think I was like the best girlfriend in the world and I'm rubbish <laughs> and I'm really expecting and I've got so many flaws and I'm really needy and I I was getting jealous in my last relationship and I've got, I'm being honest I I'm the least jealous person I know. Like I fully embrace everything. Like I mean, I'm up for it. I support everything and everyone. Um, but I was, you know, I was getting like. I was getting jealous of, like, teenage girls, like, fancying my, my fella. Yeah. We live and learn. That's the truth. So, what really is the difference between this record and the last record? <laughs> that comes across me being jealous of teenagers, actually, and Rumor Has It, which is the second song on the album, which is just, it's, it's comedy. No one should take it seriously, but there's a line in the second verse that goes, um... She's half your age, but I'm guessing that's the reason you stayed, um, which is just an exaggerated comment on how I felt. So Adele, let me ask you, would you say the last record was the complicated boyfriend and this one is the complicated you? Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> he was also a bit of an idiot though. He brought out he was an idiot and he brought the idiot out in me. <laughs> you know, now that you've been through a couple of nasty relationships, do you think that you're you're a lot smarter when it comes to relationships? Well yeah, you know, I know myself better now, like I just said. Um but um yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I know. I know what you have to put in a relationship to get out of. You know, um, and also like you know, before this relationship, you know, when you're young and you. I mean, I'm young anyway. But when I was younger, um, relationships are quite flimsy. Even though they mean a lot, it's still quite playground age. You know I mean, you can you can decide and you know go to sleep and then wake up in the morning. Oh, I don't want to be with you anymore, and it's not a big deal. Do you know what I mean? Whereas this time, yeah, I just yeah. I think the main motto I've learned in Wiser is you get what you put in. Does money buy you love? No, no. Well, even though it was a really difficult time in your life, it made a heck of a contribution to this record because it's amazing. I wanted to ask you, the first time you made an appearance on Saturday Night Live in America, how significant was it to the change of your career? Yeah, no, that was truly, truly amazing, actually. Just to be part of it anyway, before it turned into what it did that night was, um, was... Cause, you know, it's an, kind of an American institution and Josh Brolin was on it which was amazing because I'm the biggest Goonies fan and um, and then I 
heard that Tina Fey might be on it. So when I got, I, I was talking to Josh Brolin on the Friday, and we were like, "I'll be amazing if Tina Fey comes on," because obviously it was so amazing her impersonation. And then I turned up on Saturday, and I saw. Sarah Palin, but I thought it was Tina Fey. So I was going, Tina, 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 yeah, behind Sarah Palin. She didn't even notice. Um, but the show was amazing and I did meet her, but she wanted to come to my dressing room, but like everyone, all my glam squad are gay and they're like, if she comes in this room, I'm not doing your face for you, you know, because they all hated her. Um, yeah, and then everyone else came on it. Um, Alec Baldwin, uh, Marky Mark, everyone came on it. It was truly amazing. And then I just literally watched the album go up on iTunes and stuff. It was amazing. You've been doing some guest star roles in television. Is that something that you're interested in pursuing? I don't know. I'd love to. Be. Well, you know what? I mean, I was I did Ugly Betty, <laughs> which is quite funny. Um, America, actually, I met America, uh, not America, the place, uh, America, the actress, Ugly Betty. I met her at SNL as well. She came down with her with her partner to come and see me. And um, she was like, oh, I'm going to get you on the show. I'm going to get you on the show. And I was, didn't believe her. I was like, oh, all right. Well, nice to meet you. Thanks anyway, you know. And then her producers came down to the show and they said the same thing. But I was still a bit like, yeah, you won't, you won't. But thank you, you know. And then I was on it. And then we've had quite a few offers, actually, since then for me to be in kind of like comedy and sketch shows and series but I can't act to save my life I can't I couldn't even watch Ugly Betty I was just on the floor cringing I was so embarrassed I mean you know, I was just the girl that you was telling me about it's like even though I'm English I started putting on an English accent do you know what I mean like you know an American person tries to impersonate Russell Brand or something I started talking like that even though I'm already English yeah I, I wouldn't do it again I mean I'd do Ugly Betty again but obviously it's not on air anymore but I wouldn't do any other ones and I'd love if I ever if I ever got to do performed on SNL again I'd love to do a little sketch show a, one of being one of the sketches for that that'd be a lot of fun your first single off of 21 rolling in the deep it seems seems like you are basically singing the blues. Is that something that you were looking for? Yeah, Rolling in the Deep was perfect, actually. I had the first verse. I've had it for about two years. Pretty much wrote the, <laughs> I wrote the uh, first verse in the back of a cab on the way back from a TV show in, in Amsterdam. In the, in the back of a car. But yeah, no, it's exactly what I wanted, but I couldn't finish it because I wrote it a cappella and then I couldn't get to a chorus because the melody in the verse is sort of more memorable than even what the chorus is now. But so I didn't know how to get there, so um, I just put it on hold and kind of forgot about it. And then I went in the studio with Paul Letworth, who I met when I did BVs on my best friend Jack Pinata's record on his second record and he was so much fun Paul and he's so exciting like he's got so many ideas that sometimes it's impossible to keep up but it's so inspiring like do you know what I mean and compared to like usually your first session with someone's a bit like quiet and a bit awkward because you're both a bit embarrassed to like kind of throw, throw, throw ideas around and stuff like that I was just straight away into rolling in the deep and it was finished in one session but I was really got inspired by Wanda Jackson when I was touring in America and I loved how dirty and spicy and raunchy and, you know, fighting talk all of her songs were and the themes, all of her themes are, are brilliant, um, like Memory Mountain and Funnel of Love and like um, Silk Pillowcases and all that. Like, so, um, so I really sort of um, imagined stepping in, like, I kind of imagined what would Wanda Jackson do to this song, you know, and then, and then I think I've portrayed that quite well with Rolling in the Deep. And I was angry, do you know what I mean? I didn't want to write another ballad. You know, I was angry. You know, it was about an argument, the last argument or talk, even conversation that I had with my ex. And he was telling me that my life was going to be rubbish and boring and I was going to be lonely and that I was a weak person if I couldn't stay in that relationship. But it was a relationship that I already felt fucking miserable in <laughs> and really didn't feel like myself in. And my heart was just pounding. I don't get angry very often. So I, when I do get angry, I can feel my blood. I can feel my, all of my organs and all of my body. And yeah, my, so I didn't want to kind of be like, should I give up? Oh, I was like, get the fuck out of my house, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, don't cross this woman. Oh, boy. There's been a lot of talk that this record has a strong country influence. Uh, the way I see it, uh, it's only one song. I said that in one of my early interviews. I think I it was in an interview that I was doing while I was recording the record in Malibu. I, I just I was speaking a lot about country because country is a very new part of my life. And um, my bus driver when I was in America um, was from Tennessee and he introduced me to all this country and kind of bluegrass music and made me compilations and we'd stay up all night while we were while he was driving. Obviously he had to stay up because he was driving. But I'd stay up with him and we were just kind of listening to old school country and contemporary country and stuff like that and I fell in love with it. So I was saying, talking about Don't You Remember, which is the song that has got a very Americana country tinge to it and I think it just got a bit misconstrued and a bit like Chinese whispers and everyone thinks I've done a country record. But I mean, can you imagine me doing a country record with my accent? 
<laughs> but I'm very inspired by the um, melodies and lyrics in country, and that I've definitely incorporated into this record. I find them so romantic and to the point. So that I've incorporated into it, but not the banjos and stuff, not the stereotypical cowboy hats and all of that. But you already had a taste in Asheville when you worked with Jack White and the Racketeers, didn't you? We did work together. We worked together on a song called Many Shades of Black with him and the Racketeers. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was really cool. And then when I was on tour and I stopped by Nashville, we were going to go in the studio the next day, but I had to do the long journey to Detroit overnight, so we couldn't do it. But yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm only in Nashville for a few days, um, but yeah, I'm definitely going to meet up with him and I'd definitely like to do some writing and stuff with him. I think that would be very interesting, you and Jack working together. Now, The Cure the band. Why did you cover them? Well, I, mean, I wanted another cover on the album. I knew that as well, for sure. Um, initially, my first choice was Never Tear Us Apart by In Excess, just because I love that song. And it was the first song I ever learned to play on piano. And I love Michael Hutchinson's voice. And I just I just love the song. But um, I think there's a very good reason that no one's successfully covered that song is because no one can sing it as well as Michael Hutchins. Um So there is a, a version by me, probably will see the light of day at some point, I, I imagine, but probably in about 20 years. So there is a version already. There is a version, but it's not on the record. And then, um, so I said to Rick, I don't want to use this one. I, I, I don't, I can't bond with it. Like with me when I'm singing, I'm really bonded to their, you know, their song. Anyway, so then we were going through a few other options and then um, he was just telling me a story about when he was going to be producing a Barbara Streisand record but that fell through but she wanted to do a bossa nova record of covers and um him and smoky hormel who's a guitarist who plays for beck and plays on a lot of the records that rick produces and played on my record played it to me and i loved it and the cure was my first show i ever saw i was about three or four and i went to go and see them in finzi park in london with my mum and my mum was the biggest cure fan when he played it to me it was kind of quite in like down the line of the recording process and i was getting really homesick and kind of quite drained from singing all these songs that are on my you know on my new songs on my new record the song just made me burst into tears really and just kind of rescued me a little bit so it's one take all of us me and all the music just one take and my voice had gone which i was paranoid about but i think it really suits it and stuff like that and yeah i just i really enjoy it i really love it how was it working with rick rubin he's one amazing producer it was amazing it was so overwhelming it was overwhelming when i met him anyway before we even started to do a record together i met him at, I met him at snl as well so snl really was the most poignant moment in my in my life really in my musical life and he came down there and then i saw him again at the music cares dinner which is a couple of nights before the grammys and i sang a neil diamond song and obviously he'd just done the neil diamond record so how was your experience? How did you enjoy recording the record in Malibu? Well, I've got to tell you, I didn't like Malibu very much. I loved being in the studio, but I wanted to... Uh, I was going to stay in Santa Monica. Rick suggested that I rent a house near the studio. It was a lovely house and beautiful studio. Everyone lives behind a gate. You don't see anyone. You can't... Nothing's within walking distance. So you, I, mean, I was in a car the whole time. I'm allergic to the sun, pretty much. Beach boys don't fancy me and I don't fancy them. So I was pretty bored when I weren't in the studio. <laughs> well, it really sounds like England is home for you so let me ask you what's next for you we've had 19 we have 21 45 i'm joking i don't know <laughs> that's a deal i'll see you at 45 thank you very oh, thank much thank you very much thank you thank you for listening to popstar conversations please join us again for another conversation with your favorite musical artists You're listening to Popstar Conversations, taking you inside with your favorite musical artists. This week, Chuck and I are sitting here with one of the most famous entertainers on the planet, Beyonce. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming. Beyonce, you've had this stage persona called Sasha for quite a while now. Do you think this character is becoming more dominant? I think it has gotten more dominant. You know, I'm not bringing it out for the first time. People have been knowing about it. And, you know, I've been having the fans hold up Sasha signs for years now because I do have these two sides to my personality as well as everyone. I thought, wow, this is great for me to kind of distinguish the difference between the sound of my album because I was battling and I always am. I love to sing these beautiful ballads and to show my vulnerability and to sing about love and to sing about passion and even pain and heartache. And I'm very sensitive and I am a lot more vulnerable and kind of introverted than people 
people might expect. And when I'm on the stage, I'm very confident. I'm very, you know, sensual. I am not afraid of anything. I'm fearless and I have this strength. You know, I don't walk around with for the stage. So I recorded like 70 songs and I decided, how am I going to, how am I going to break this down to one album? And it wasn't, it was impossible because some of the songs felt like the stage and some of the songs felt really intimate. So I said, this is incredible for me to introduce people to me, to who, who I am. Even the, the sound of the instruments in the music, I think people will be surprised that I even like the, the acoustic guitar and some of the strings and some of the, the, the sounds that are in the music. Um, so I'm introducing them to who I am and I'm reintroducing them to Sasha Fierce. So I split it into two. So the albums, the double discs, each separately feel cohesive and it feels like one album. If you're in the mood for something that's a little more thought provoking or make you makes you feel, um, you can put in I am. And if you want to dance and you want the, the the crazy in love, the high energy, the the sexy, overly confident Sasha Fierce, you have that album. Why did you give Sasha the last name Fierce? To make her a real person? I guess so. I guess Sasha needed, it was time for her to have her last name. And Fierce is an adjective we use for something that's just hot that's spicy and to to make her last name fierce is a big statement <laughs> beyonce this current project i am sasha fierce it it's it appears to be extremely ambitious why did you take that creative approach because I work really hard and I'm very passionate. And even if it's something that I do in a month or something I do in a year, I put my heart and my soul into it. And actually, now that I spent so much time, I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> you know, I wanted to challenge myself and really take a break. And I couldn't take a break because I don't know how, because I love what I do. So in my year of time off, I ended up recording all of these songs. And I didn't say, okay, I'm going to, you know, spend a whole year on making a record. It happened that way because I, I said, I'm not going to put a record out until next year. And I ended up recording all of these songs. And I learned that this album is great, but I'm going to, the more time I have, the more records I'm going to record. And I plan on being here for a long time. So uh, I'll, whatever inspires me, once I feel like I have a record, I'll, I'll put it out. But I have to tell you, with this record, you could definitely tell that you're taking it to the next level because these songs they're very out of the box and that was something that was conscious i wanted to make sure i did something different and i i remember riding in the car and hearing aretha franklin say a great singer can sing any type of music and they make whatever genre their own and I, that some that was something that really stuck in my head and I thought you know I love this song if I were a boy it doesn't sound like a typical R&B song but I'm not a typical R&B artist and I feel like I have one of the voices that can sing whatever I want and I have the emotional capacity to sing about whatever I want so I wanted to show that you recorded the rock song that's why you're beautiful you did a great job Thank you. That's why you beautiful you're beautiful reminds me of like some prints or some rock and roll. I love that record. And actually the engineer played the guitar and, and created the track. The engineer that was in the studio. It was it's one of my favorite records because it's kind of about to me all of the the people in the world that that don't make it, you know, that try in their relationship, but it's just something that that's hard to do, especially right now. And especially with celebrities. And I say in the song, somebody's got to stay in love and that could be us. And that's why we're beautiful. And it's very personal. And I, I love it. Do you see yourself as a role model when it comes to relationships? I feel like, yes, I feel like I am a role model and I didn't choose to be, but I have become one because I'm in the public eye and it's something that I am aware of. I, I always say, hopefully can inspire young girls and inspire adults and women and men and people in relationships. And hopefully this album will, will inspire and speak to all of my fans. Did your role in the movie Cadillac Records, did it have a strong influence on disc one of this record? 
a lot of this this album was inspired by Etta James. The sound, you know, the tone of my voice, not so much, but the risks, you know, me completely changing my style was definitely inspired by Etta James because she was the queen of rock and roll, so R&B. She did not put herself in one box and she didn't care what people expected. She didn't care what critics had to say. She didn't care. She just was Etta James. She didn't care who was in the room. She was at a James, you know, and I love and respect that so much. So when I was back in the studio, the songs that I loved, even if it didn't make sense or if, if it didn't sound like a Beyonce record, I still tried it. And if I loved it, I put it on my album, regardless if, if it was something that I thought people would understand or people would expect. Actually, if it was something they expected, you know, I, I didn't want to do it, but I, I would definitely had more courage to take an artistic risk and to to challenge my my vocals and you know some of the the acting that I did in the movie you can see in the video you can see or hear in the way I'm singing in in my tone you know some of the songs is just acoustic guitar and it's like I'm standing there naked it's nothing that hides anything and you can hear everything you can hear the lyrics come to life and um, that's something just with, with acting and connecting the emotion with the lyrics and but all of those things are learned from doing movies and and I think I just keep growing and whenever I do a movie it inspires my music so I'm curious did the role of Etta James possess you that's like slightly she did slightly possess me and I actually got to work with her I'm not I'm sorry I got to meet her and sing for her and um, she was sitting in the audience and I did at last and I know that she's a she's you know a tough woman and just because I'm a, a star she doesn't care she's not impressed so you know when I walked out I could see her her body language was like all right what is this girl about to do and as I I started singing you could see her change her body position and you saw her punch her 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 son like did you hear that you know and she got excited and by the end she was so excited and I was just honored and she told me you are a bad girl and that's the best compliment she could give me because she would never lie <laughs> <laughs> the song if I were a boy are you separating the men from the boys? It's a difference between the men and the boys. And the song, you know, that's why I say, but you're just a boy. You have a lot to learn, you know. And in in the in the song, you know, I, I, I talk about all the things that, that boys do in, in relationships. You know, when they don't listen, when they don't appreciate, when they take you for granted. Um, you know, it's something as simple as someone paging you and you just like putting it away like oh, I'll deal with that later or um, coming home really late because you know your woman is going to be there and you you don't have to worry about her she's going to be faithful but you can do whatever you want you know it's it's those it's those things that are even sometimes more painful than infidelity it's those subtleties and that's what the video is about and and I played this strong woman um, that was having having a not an affair but having an inappropriate relationship with with my partner at work and doing all these little manipulative things and then right in the end when you're like gosh she's a terrible girlfriend you realize it was his life the whole time so you I wanted all of the men to watch it with open eyes and I felt like if it was a man the whole time they may not see it they may justify in their mind why he's doing certain things but if they see a woman doing it then they can see it for what it really is and um, it's kind of like Freaky Friday role reversal and all of the guys are like tr completely tripping out like God you got me like I I was like I hate her and then they realized it was them <laughs> you know I think it worked so if you were a man what would you do um I mean I think I would be a man and not a little boy I wouldn't do those things and that's what I say I, I would understand I would listen just something as simple as listen um but I, I, people have been asking me, what would you do if, if you were a man? And I would do really simple things. I really would be interested in knowing how it must feel to walk into a club and see, you know, women and see a beautiful woman and you walk up to her and have to ask her 
out or ask her you know that has to be a bit of pressure and you know women we don't really get rejected because we don't have to ask but it has to feel really weird to say finally get the strength and then they like shut you down that has to <laughs> feel really really tough um but you know I don't feel bad that's the that's the hardest thing <laughs> um I would probably go to like a barber shop and just listen and get the unfiltered conversations that men have you must be really looking forward to touring this album I'm so, so, so anxious. And I can't wait for it to come out because for one, I know everyone's gonna be really surprised. And I can't wait to hear everyone's feedback because I've been working on the tour, the production and uh, starting on the costumes. And I've st I start early so I can really pay attention to all, all of the details. But six months ago, I had my first meeting. And it's hard now because I, I always try to listen to what the fans wanna hear and because I can't perform everything off the album. It's like 16 songs. And then I have about 40 songs <laughs> that I have already. So it's always, always difficult. So I, I'm very interested to hear the feedback so I can get my set list together for the tour. Will your mother still be designing the outfits? Um, I'm actually, she, she always, um, cause uh, the last tour I had many designers, it was Ellie Saab, it was Armani, it was Versace, it was all of my favorite designers and my mother designed some of them. But this one, I think I'm, I'm going to work with one designer, which I've had some meetings with and he is unbelievably talented he is completely an artist but i can't say the name yet until it's closer to the time of the tour you formed the backup band sugar mama why and uh, are you gonna continue with them yes they are incredible you know i'm always embracing my curves and and i love women that uh, um are real women and i i mean i feel like all of us we're all different for a reason and i think it's beautiful to be all different weights and different shapes and different sizes and I had every woman represented on the stage all different races and different unique looks and the sugar mamas were the most confident I mean if I could hang out with anybody in the band I would just listen to the sugar mamas talk all day they are like comedians and they are so animated and just characters they are hilarious so I, I wanted to show that and I put them in the sexy dresses and you know I, I wanted them to do the uh-oh dance because they could get down like the dancers and they're very talented so they'll be on the next tour too so there is a difference in the chemistry of an all-girl band oh absolutely there's a, a deep connection with you know all the women on the stage and I, i've had incredible musicians incredible bands in the past but it's not even close to compare i can't compare my my connection with the female band and with the bands in the past just because i admire them so much you know most young girls when they're in around that age they're thinking about other things these women were all in love with their instruments and they were focused and they are strong and they can play as good if not even tighter than than the guys and I just respect it so much and I think about all of the young girls that are in the audience that can see that and say wow I want to learn how to play the saxophone I want to be a drummer you know and and maybe it can give them more focus because music for me you know when I was a teenager I avoided doing drugs I avoided you know getting into bad relationships because I didn't have time for that if somebody you know was doing me wrong or if went was cheating on me or wasn't being the kind of guy that I needed I just was too busy anyway so I'm like get out of here I'm on to the next you know and it gave me a lot of confidence in music and I feel like it can really give a lot of other young girls hope and, and give them confidence and teach them self-esteem and it's, it's just so important so I, I really really love that my idea of having the female band came to life because it sounded great when I was like okay how am I gonna do this but it was easier than I could ever imagine there's so many talented women out there you'll be performing at the EMAs in Liverpool do you still get nervous at these occasions 
Oh, absolutely. I'm really nervous about this show because it's the first time I perform my new music. I, you know, I know it's going to be shown all around the world and it's a huge deal for me and I will be nervous. <laughs> but, you know, that's a part of, of my life and that's a part of the transformation into my alter ego. Whenever whenever I'm afraid, then I, I need to call on something to take over. And that's what happened. Beyonce, thank you and Sasha Fierce very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again for listening to Pop Star Conversations. Be sure to click the subscribe button below and hit the red bell so that you'll be notified of our next exclusive interview. Thank you again for listening. Thank you for listening to Pop Star Conversations. Please join us again for another conversation with your favorite musical artist. You're listening to Pop Star Conversations, taking you inside with your favorite musical artists. This week, Randy and I will be speaking to the multi talented Bruno Mars. Bruno, welcome to the show. Bruno, thanks. It's man. good to have you here. You were an artist, turned producer, turned artist. Why has success taken so long? You started when you were four. <laughs> um, because it had to take this long for me to understand a little more about producing and writing songs. I kind of moved up to California, a little wet behind the ears and, and just a little green, thinking that, you know, it's like the movies where you get signed and, you know, hit records are falling into your lap. You're working with big producers and big songwriters and then, you, you know, you make your album and you tour the world, but it's not like that. You know, you really have to create your own product. And also, you know, I, I, I wanted to be that. I want, you can't just say I want to be an artist. You know, you have to do what your favorite artists do, and that's write your own songs and perform them. How does it feel to be in the spotlight? That was never the plan. You know, that was never like, um, you know, we never thought like, okay, well, this is how we break me is, you know, do these couple songs and then do your own song. It just kind of lined up like that and the stars align and nothing on you and billionaire and then now just the way you are. Your songs have done extremely well. How does it feel when people call you a natural entertainer? <laughs> I don't know. Um, live is just, that's my, my upbringing. That's what I grew up doing. I, I, I love performing. I love playing with my band. I love picking up a guitar and, and jamming. And, you know, that's been my thing since I can remember. So when we, you know, when those mics turn on, we unleash the beast. <laughs> well, you certainly do that. Bruno, I had seen some photos of you at the beginning. You started out your career as an Elvis impersonator. I got to tell you, they looked really great. Thanks, man. Yes, that's right. You were a tourist attraction at the Sheraton Waikiki. <laughs> it was a, definitely a tourist attraction. You know, it was just a it was a gimmick thing. You know, I, I was a, I was fascinated at Elvis at such a young age. And I, my father had the show going on, and I used to watch the show every night. And finally, he let me on stage. I've been begging him, you know, come on, put me on. On, coach put me on and finally he let me go on stage to an Elvis song and that's when uh, you know that was it for me as I have to do it every night so he would bring me up on stage every night until finally they worked the segment out for me and my mother made me an Elvis outfit and then they would introduce me as the world's youngest Elvis impersonator and I would come out and sing these Elvis songs that must have been a lot of fun at that age you were even in the movie honeymoon in Vegas yeah right <laughs> crazy besides elvis didn't you also add michael jackson and prince to your impersonations um yeah uh um uh, impersonation show see my whole thing my whole thing is man is i i kind of um I don't want to use the word hustle my way through life, but, um, you know, an impersonation show came down to Hawaii and they said, well, we're looking for impersonators. Who could you impersonate? And I said, oh, I could do Michael Jackson. So I, I, I auditioned and I sang uh, Billie Jean and I started dancing and I got the gig. You know, I've been a Michael Jackson fan forever. Started doing that. At, at, during high school, I would go to school and then go impersonate Michael Jackson after school at like a Las Vegas style show in Waikiki. Some people make a hell of a career just doing that. Of course, you've obviously moved on. Yeah. Well, because, you know, you grow out of it. Well, for me anyway, it, it was just more something. I just need to do music, even if it was to the extreme of wearing an, a costume. You know, at least I was doing music and uh, yeah, I wasn't getting into trouble. Yeah, that, that was that was just my whole thing was I, I just love i love music man and it's kind of all I've, I've known would you say that your collective experiences prepared you for the big stage yeah well it's a little comfortable you know it, it gets you comfortable on stage and 
it, it gets you in that practice. You know, I used to work five days a week at, when I was a kid at, at that age. And, and no one, at, you know, my mom and dad were real strict about my schooling. And, you know, it was never it was never something that they wanted me to do. It's just I needed to do it. And I wanted to do it. I would probably throw a fit if, you know, they would told me I couldn't. So it definitely, you know, it was just training, you know, for, to, for you. It's not easy to just jump up on a stage and not be nervous. And, and I think doing that my whole life has helped me. This path and this work ethic, how did it contribute to your songwriting? The simplicity of sometimes people just want to hear a song. Sometimes people just want to hear somebody sing a song and capture an emotion. So when I recorded songs like, you know, I have a song called Count On Me. And I, I feel like that's all I wanted to do was just play a guitar and sing a song. It doesn't have to be the most clever lyrics or poetic. It has to come from the heart. You obviously know what you're doing. Tell me, why did you move to L.A. after high school? Mm, well, it was just, you know, I didn't want to be wearing an Elvis costume forever. <laughs> or um, no Michael Jackson costume forever. I, I wanted to take my music to the next level. And I felt like that was the next level was to maybe even find myself and figure out some things. I needed a lot of learning to do. You can't just jump from doing Vegas shows to being a recording artist overnight. And that's what I did. I went to L.A. and, and basically learned and learned how to write a song and compose a song and figure out on myself what kind of songs I want to what kind of songs I want to write, what kind of songs I want to sing to people. So all that led you to a deal at Motown. What happened when you got there? Um, nothing. When I got signed to Motown, that was, uh, you know, I can't put the blame on anybody. I got signed at a very young age, and thankfully that helped me. You know, it was my frustration, because like I said, it's not like the movies where you think that you get signed and all of a sudden, you know, you're going to be write, uh, recording hit songs. So it showed me, like, basically that's not what it is. And got me so frustrated I said you know what I'm just gonna do it myself I'm not gonna I'm tired of waiting on other people to write a song for me or or to produce for me when I can play instruments I could produce you know if I wanted to I, I I mean I can write a song I can make words rhyme and and sing sing and sing you know so it was because of the frustration on my first deal I learned so much so by the time I got so if I ever had another chance I'd be ready so that chance came and I think I was a little more prepared that must have been a bit disappointing heartening but you didn't let it get you down you got some of your friends and you created a band called the Smeezingtons tell us a bit about that that's right the Smeezingtons but our friends call us the Measingtons so you can call me the Measington <laughs> what does that mean it doesn't mean anything no uh, you know what we don't really take ourselves too seriously and we're having so much fun doing music that we, you know every time we would write a song we'd always say oh this is gonna be a smash and then it turned into this is gonna be a smeeze and then it formed into this is gonna be a smeezington it was just became kind of a joke in the studio you know every time we got together with people they'd be like oh those guys think every song is a smeezington so we just started calling ourselves that and we said how funny would it be if one day these record labels would get on the phone and be like i need the smeezingtons and it happened how do you choose the artists that you work with and uh do you have any interesting people coming up? Oh, you know what? If, man, if I, if I had the time, I'd work with anybody. You know, that's the fun part about our job is that we get, or at least take on the challenge of working with anybody from you know, CeeLo to, a, you know, Celine Dion. We're, we're not trying to, we don't turn our shoulders to any artist that want to work. It's a challenge for us. We like to jump around from in different music. We're not snooty, like, oh, we only do this. You wrote a song with Flo Rida, Bright Round. Seems to have a little bit of a sexual connotation. Ah, that's right. Right Round. <laughs> Sex has been pop culture since forever, I think. You know, big songs, not 1950s songs. Shake, rattle, and roll. Rock and roll means sex. That term has been around forever. When you've been talking about rock and roll, it means having sex and rocking and rolling. I think that's just something that comes with the bag of music, especially in, in, in pop music. Would you say that your musical influences, they range from reggae to rock and obviously, you know, many others in between? Yeah. I, you know, for this album, I just sat down and wrote a bunch of songs that I, I just wrote man I just wrote songs uh, I, you know the way I felt that day I didn't really overthink it or, or or even come up with a theme you know for the album I just 
wanted to to write the best songs I could. You know, I want people to know that this is the beginning. This is just the first album, and I, I hope they enjoy it. I mean everything that I'm saying in, in these songs. I got such a long way to go. Bruno, I think you've definitely arrived. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks again for joining us at Popstar Conversations. Make sure that you click the subscribe button below and hit the bell so that you'll be notified when our next exclusive interview with upcoming artists like Beyonce, Cher, Molly Cyrus, and so many more are available. Thank you again for subscribing. Thank you for listening to Popstar Conversations. Please join us again for another conversation with your favorite musical artist. You're listening to Popstar Conversations, taking you inside with your favorite musical artists. Today, Chuck and I are sitting here with one of the music industry's biggest superstars, Celine Dion. Thanks so much for coming. Why did it take you six years to follow up on your last album? But why not? Don't tell me you miss me that much. Oh, come on. Don't tell me you miss me that much. I haven't stopped really. I had two kids and I did perform a lot. I'm, I'm performing in Las Vegas at the Coliseum of, in Las Vegas um, almost every night. Not every night, but like a lot. Four nights a week, uh, about 70 shows a year. And then, uh, I mean, from two kids to uh, I'm on my third years of the show already with this new show. I haven't stopped a lot. But from the industry, it's been six years. So um, it was worth it. It was worth it the wait because I had great uh, great people to work with and I'm very proud of this album. You've committed yourself to another couple of years in Las Vegas. Is that is that difficult to do so many shows? I don't know. I don't want to know. <laughs> no, I don't do that. I take one show at a time. That's the only way to go. How old am I going to be? I'll take a walker to sing My Heart Will Go On. <laughs> Every night. <laughs> <laughs> see you. Oh goodness, we'll see. Does it get boring for you performing at the same venue night after night for so many shows? No, you know, traveling when you have three kids, it's 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 hard. It's hard to travel. I mean, it's fantastic because you see the world and you move, and it's more rock and roll, and it's wonderful. You know, like <gasps> you're breathing, and it's great. But the jet lag and the difference of uh, for a singer, anyway, for um, the, the 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 allergies and different allergies different seasons and all that it's not like a musician that takes his guitar and you know it's 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 different but and with kids it's really hard they live in hotels and now i can be home they can raise be raised in the house and stability is very important when you raise children and i can still do what i love so i can still do i i, I found i i found a, a compromise it's like uh i can perform and i can have a good time and do my show business world as a singer and have a good time but as a mother i can accomplish what needs to be accomplished and be uh uh, have stability for my children that makes complete sense can you tell us a little bit about the song uh, love me back to life that Sia wrote for you yeah Sia wrote me this amazing song and um, my son thought it was a joke because he thought that Sia is writing for Rihanna which is very cool and my my mother is not cool you know I'm not cool I'm not cool I'm a mother and I don't want to be cool I'm the queen of no <laughs> no is no <laughs> and then um, he thought she was writing for uh, the cool the cool uh, ladies and that what she wrote you a song it must be a mistake and I said no she wrote me a song so maybe I'm a little cool huh <laughs> so um, I, I was amazed myself that she thought of me and she wrote me that song it was uh, it's an it's an amazing song it's to have a chance to have um I don't write my songs so uh, I'm at the mercy of songs and I'm waiting for people to write songs for me and when I receive a song like that which is very powerful but very modern have you ever written songs for yourself uh, I write songs for other people <laughs> Yeah, my um, actually, I, I wrote a couple of songs for um, his name is Mark, and he's the the the, the husband of um, my stepdaughter, and uh, he's had great success with them. They're great songs, but when I write the songs, I I don't hear me singing them, so I gave it to him, and he's had great success. So I'm very happy for him. Why is it that you don't write for yourself? No, no, I think people can write better than I do. I let them send me songs and if they don't send me songs anymore i'll have no choice actually at one point i'll have to write my songs but right now i think that it's it's really two different careers which a lot of people can do both and it's wonderful i don't think i have um 
I think I could if I wouldn't have any choice. But because I'm very spoiled and people send me amazing songs, I don't feel like I have to do it, so I don't. Stevie Wonder is on this record. How was it working with him? I, I still can't imagine. I mean, even for me, what I've done in my career, singing with, uh, for example, you know, Luciano Pavarotti and Barbara Streisand, and you know, like there, there's and the Bee Gees. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that I did in my career that I'm I think about now, and I'm like, I'm not sure if I realized that with how amazing it, they were. Uh, singing with Stevie Wonder, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't never ask to do this, but I guess some people have guts and. <laughs> They said, when we should ask, you know, because he said that, because we've met a couple of times, obviously, and um, it was a man thing to, to, to do. And, and he was interested, and I was like, <sighs> I, was, I was just amazed. So we had a, a good time. It was, uh, it was done uh, separately um, because we couldn't do it together that time. But um, for me to have a duet with him is just an amazing gift because Stevie Wonder is the first album I, I bought for myself with my own money a long time ago with the, the Orange album. And uh, that was the, the, the time where people were looking at the art, their favorite artist, and face to face and kissing the album so much that they were peeling off. And um, I did that with Stevie Wonder. Celine, is there anybody that you'd love to collaborate with, but yet you haven't? Well, I wish I could have sung with uh, Freddie Mercury, but he's no longer with us, so that's going to be a little hard. And how about Eminem? My son has this on his list. Oh, gosh. Yeah, my son is into Eminem. He's great. He's really, really, really great. So um, that's his favorite. Are we going to hear a different Celine on this album? No, it's not a different Celine, but it's Celine six years later. And what happens is that you have knowledge more, maturity, experience. You're 45, you're not 39. You know what I'm saying? It's different. And you evolve and you grow and you mature and it's better. It's definitely better. But what's better about it is that the kids wrote me songs. Now the kids are writing me songs, which is great. Before it was the adults. The adults wrote me songs because I was the kid. And now the kids are writing songs for me. It's fascinating. I've been in show business that long. That That's what I... <laughs> I take from it, but it's wonderful because they keep it fresh for me, so I really appreciate it. I'm not hearing as much of the vocal gymnastics in this record like we have in a lot of your previous other records. Well, actually, yes, it's just that it's different Olympics. The holding, holding back. Uh, for me to do uh, 30 years of a career with singing with the more of a classical, not classical background, but more, how can I say, um, you know, holding the notes and having no crisp in the voices like it's no no um, like how do you say like when your voice is like um, raspy no raspiness it's like clear raspiness before for me was like um, you're not in shape you know uh, it needed to be clean clear different and I was like I'm letting my voice go let it go let it go let it go let it go so there's a raspiness that goes with it and it's a roughness and modern and so it's not it's not I'm not trying it's like I'm I'm just letting letting it letting it go. Celine, I've heard that you're looking for the bathroom voice. Obviously you're talking about the acoustics, right? The bathroom. Yeah. Well, you have something special in the in those styles. They resonate very well and they make everybody sound very good. You should try it one day in the shower. You'll sound very good. No, no. <laughs> I'll leave that up to you. So you have the bathroom and then there's the bedroom voice also. That's right. The bathroom. Same thing, shower, bathroom, <laughs> toilet. <laughs> oh, the bedroom. I heard bathroom. The bedroom voice. No, because did you see in the EPK? I showed like the... I asked my... Um, I asked my uh, my sound engineer to come in the toilet. I said, this is the sound I'm looking for. And he's looking at me like, if I'm, am I serious? Ah, 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 You see how it, it's like, it's, it's great. It's like, ha, ah, you know, and he's like, okay, what do you want me to do? Bring the toilet seat in the recording studio or do you want me to bring a microphone into the toilet? Like, there was like quite something. But the, the bedroom voice, well, we call it, the, I call it the bedroom voice because uh, when you wake up in the morning, most of the time, you will have a little, uh, I'm tired of this empty house. I need a drink to get me out. A couple more till I forget your name. I saw a guy that looked like you. I didn't know what to do. It took a power of will to break my stare. I realized what I wanted wasn't there. So it's it 
it's it's the um, it's the letting go. It's the relax. Just waking up and like, oh, just about stretching up and try to sing better. You know. It's different. It's a different. It's a different sound. And so, does that lyric demand that type of an acoustic? That's why, because the song demands that voice. It's not that I'm trying to invent voice. It's because the sound. The this. You know, we're trying to serve music as best as we can. Every song deserves to be unique, and those songs this time needs a, 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 an approach that is drier, more true. It's not in the clouds. It's very. It's very in in your face there's not a lot of um how would i say like uh tweaking and making like like bigger than it is and not trying to hold so much and even sometimes cutting like cutting voices or like tearing or it's edgy like yeah yeah boy you know like it's what it's what the song needs you've collaborated with neo egg white and a lot of other young writers on this record are you keeping up and following the up-and-coming new artists i'm not following nothing i trust those kids do your work children and present your work to mommy when you're done no <laughs> what is that they work so well they have such a wonderful way to write and when they send me songs i'm like oh my god I, i'm so thankful i can't believe they they're, they're taking me in consideration they can send everything to adele writes her own song to, so just too bad for them but they can send it to rihanna and beyonce and i don't know a lot of people out there but um they thought of me too so um, i'm thankful one last question what makes celine dion happy my children motherhood definitely where i'm from my, my family my parents but to be a mother is my greatest accomplishment thank you so much for being here thanks so much for coming thanks again for joining us at pop star conversations make sure that you click the subscribe button below and hit the bell so that you'll be notified when our next exclusive interview with upcoming artists like beyonce molly cyrus and so many more are available thank you again for subscribing Thank you for listening to Popstar Conversations. Please join us again for another conversation with your favorite musical artist. You're listening to Popstar Conversations, taking you inside with your favorite musical artist. This week, Chuck and I are sitting here with the timeless icon, Cher. It's truly a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for coming. First off, I have to ask you, why has it taken you 12 years to put out a new record? Is it 12? I thought it was 11. No, Living Proof was in 2011. Are you testing me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. People, people, yesterday, people kept saying 11. I, oh, this is a silly answer, but it's the truth. I just forgot. If you knew me, you'd, it would make perfect sense, too. You know, and also, I was signed to Warner's UK, and Rob Dickens was the president, and he and I were very close. And when my contract ran out there, I just didn't think about Warner's America. I just, you know, it didn't occur to me that they would want to make a record. And then I was working. And then if it hadn't been for my one manager, you know, I don't think I would have done it. I just thought maybe it was too, I thought it was just maybe too late and the Farewell album was it. So you're telling me that they had to remind you to do another album? Yeah, my, my he didn't just remind me. He just said, get in the studio. This is insane. We were told that you were doing a 60s type of cover album or a Southern rock type of album. Whatever happened to that project? I, I thought about certain. I like country music, and and I like. Look, I want to go do old standards at Carnegie Hall. So there's lots of things that you think about, and sometimes you do them, and sometimes you just think about them. Well, as a result, this ended up as a dance pop album. Do you still socialize in the club scene at all? You know, I just went out because of Women's World, but it's hard because now everyone's got a, an iPhone. So, you know, the moment you go someplace, you know, there are horrible pictures taken of you everywhere and, and they're on Twitter or Facebook immediately. So I have to pick my times. It's not easy like it used to be. Like you just run to a club and dance till your hair was wet and then go home. Whatever happened to the song, The Greatest Thing, uh, you recorded with Lady Gaga? Someone just leaked it yesterday, day before yesterday. But we did it, and they didn't even leak the right version, which is really a pisser. But we did it, and then she said, I don't really like it. And I went, okay. Let me ask you something. 
What was it like working with Lady Gaga? Well, we actually, she was on tour and I came in from Las Vegas. So we didn't really work together. Plus, she wasn't working with Red One. She had worked with someone else on her album. So she didn't really want to come in. But I mean, I, I, she seems nice enough. You know, when I, the times I met her, she was just charming and very sweet. Didn't you also collaborate with Pink on a couple of songs? Well, Pink is, I mean, I know Alicia, so that's a different thing. Cher, let me ask you about your album title, Closer to the Truth. What kind of truth are you talking about? I'm not talking about any truth. They said come up with a working title, and, and there's a line in one of Alicia's songs, and it says, Closer to the Truth, and I just remember, it says, and I get angry as I get closer to the truth. And I don't even know why, but the Closer to the Truth just stuck in my, in my mind. I didn't even plan to call it that. I had no idea what I was going to call it. After listening to this album, there's elements of, like, club goers, the empowerment of women, drag queens. Well, hopefully it'll be a couple of other things will eek out. I mean, a couple other, maybe some men will fall in there, but yeah, I think it's, you know, club goers and, you know, there are tracks on here that women will really love and there are tracks on here that gay guys will love and drag queens will love, Dress to Kill, you know, drag queen dream come true. Will you be touring this album? Yeah, I think I will because, look, I didn't think I would come back from Farewell because it was three and a half years and it was just enough, you know, and it was so hard. Even though at the end, the last gig, I didn't want to stop, but I was tired and needed to break. But I won't, I won't ever tour again because there's no way that I'm going to go out older than I am. It's too hard. Touring is just too hard. Shows are not hard, but touring is terribly hard. And I don't really like the tour part. I like the show part, I like the performance part. Let me ask you, is there a difference between the share at home and the share on stage? You know, the share that's in the public eye is kind of a magnified version of me, but I'm pretty much myself, except I'm like, I'm not, when I'm not working, I'm not a clothes horse anymore, truthfully. I'm just as happy to run around in sweatpants as I am in a gown, beaded gown. As a matter of fact, I'm just not even interested too much in beaded gowns. I'm more shy in my private life. I'm actually pretty shy in my private life, but in my work life, I don't have that. So you purposely separate the two because one is work and my ideas of work are so much more well defined i know what i need to do my work i'm not hesitant i'm not nervous to ask for what i need because i know what has to happen and in my private life i'm you know it's not like i'm not running the show and in my private life i kind of am much more i'm just shy in my private life that's i've that's i've always been that person and maybe that's why i know a lot of people in my in, the, in my business that are very shy and somehow this was the work they, ch they chose or this is the work that chose them so would you say after all of these years in show business that you know what's really important in life mm -hmm. well I guess just sweating the small stuff, you know, being upset over things that you're going to forget that it don't matter. I mean, my mother gave me a great piece of advice when I was young, but I, I kind of took it in one way, but I didn't really take it in totality of it. And that was, if it doesn't matter in five years, it doesn't matter. And I should remember it more often. Cher, let's talk about the documentary, Dear Mom, uh, Love Cher. Is that you paying tribute to a woman that you truly admire? Well, you know, it, it, it was a title that there were many titles that they brought and that was the best one it started a year before that I made this documentary myself a teeny little documentary for my mom's birthday it was a birthday present and um, because she had done this album she had recorded this album when she was 50 and it got lost and then she found it and I took it and you know digital I just with digital magic took the track and you know brought it back to life and fixed every song and then she wanted I, I I said mom why don't you come to the studio and and just lip sync them and it'd be really fun and then we found a track on there that we were both doing a duet and neither one of us remember ever recording it we didn't even remember who wrote it but so we did that and so it was her 86th birthday and I just wanted to do something special for her and my sister said share well she calls me stupid stupid you know mom wants these tracks done and she's found them what do you think and so I just kind of took over from there. And then I was editing the little, 
It was 18 minutes, I think. I was editing the little documentary at my house, and my agent came in, because she and I are friends, and she said, this is too good just to be a birthday present. And she took it to the people at Lifetime, and they said, oh, sure, this makes sense. That's a Mother's Day special. And what is the best advice that your mother gave you? Well, if it doesn't matter in five years, it doesn't matter. And if you're going to steal something, make sure you go to jail for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. Cher, thank you very much for coming in. We really, really Thanks enjoyed so it. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thanks again for joining us at Pop Star Conversations. Make sure that you click the subscribe button below and hit the bell so that you'll be notified when our next exclusive interview with upcoming artists like Beyonce, Molly Cyrus, and so many more are available. Thank you again for subscribing. Thank you for listening to Pop Star Conversations. Please join us again for another conversation with your favorite musical artist. You're listening to Popstar Conversations, taking you inside with your favorite musical artists. Today, Chuck and I are sitting here with a multi-talented singer, songwriter, producer, guitarist, and actor, Ed Sheeran. Ed, welcome to the show. Ed, good to see you. Do you enjoy doing interviews? No, do you know what? It's It, it goes up, up and down. I was in where we go? Holland in... Uh, Den Haag and I did three interviews there and they were the best interviews I've ever done like just fucking really cool and they were just all about kind of like like they weren't about my music or me they were just about what I, what I thought about the music industry which I kind of love talking about so yeah it was um it was good but then I had some radio interviews this morning that were you know in interviews when they just state facts and you just agree and you go yeah that did happen it's that kind of vibe however plus is not your first album it's your third isn't it I'd like to I'd like to call it my first album because it's my first kind of imprint on mainstream society. Uh, well, the pr the previous two were done 2006, 2007. So um, this one's a lot more mature and it's a lot more rounded, and I kind of know what my sound is, and I'd like to think it's better. Ed, would you consider this more of a folk hip hop record, or what category would you put this in? Yeah, I mean the the thing the thing I didn't want to get boxed into was confusing the the audience too much because I have a lot of influences and a lot of loves in music and um, if you put all of them onto one album sometimes it confuses people so I took the opportunity with five different EPs to make five different sounds that I was really into and uh, through the course of that I kind of realised what my sound would be by making other people's sounds so this is my sound. Is it more important for you to be known as a rapper or for your guitar playing? I don't want to be the best anything. I want to be the best me I can be. I know that I, I know that sounds really twee and shit, but um, like there are rappers out there that are always going to be better than me, and there are the guitarists out there that are always going to be better than me. But there's there's no one that can make my music better than me, so I'm just going to continue doing my music. Was it Damien Rice who inspired you to be a musician? Yeah, Damien Rice was the moment where I realised you didn't have to be in a in a band to make it. You can or even make an impact because i saw him play and one guy on stage had more presence than any rock band and it was it was really cool what inspired you to write about a heroin addicted prostitute in the a-team and were you really surprised that it became such a hit it's weird with the a-team because radio never wants to play it and tv never wants to play it and then it just blew up and then everyone had to play it and it, it, it was just a bit it was a bit it was a bit strange it, uh, like to have a song get successful in that way and to be playing gig like most of my gigs the average age is between about 18 and 40 but sometimes i get big booked for younger shows like i got booked for this show called uh girl guides gig and it was at uh, wembley arena and it was around 12,000 eight year old girls um because it was just their kind of like girl scouts thing so when i played that song and you have 12,000 eight year old girls singing go mad for a couple of grams i was kind of like wow this <laughs> this is definitely crossed over <laughs> yeah i think um i think you know because the song's done tastefully and it's not obvious that it's about a drug addict unless you actually properly listen into it i think i, I think people people are okay with it in the song you need me i don't need you in those lyrics are you referring to someone or something specifically it's kind of about the industry and it's not really about me either i know it's kind of a very kind of personal song with lyrics about my life and stuff but it's it's kind of more of a i wanted to create a kind of anthem for independent musicians out there to be able to say look like at some point you do need a label because you do need the international the marketing the press the tv the whatever but you don't need 
an A and R if you know what you want to do. Like some some acts, like pop acts, definitely need their A and Rs. They need people to write with. They need kind of producers and stuff. But if you do your thing and you know it's good, if someone comes up to you and tells you to change it, then that's what you need to say. You need me. I don't need you because the industry would not run if it wasn't for acts that made their own music、um, and did it well. Because you can have pop bands all day long, but when someone like Adele comes up, that refunds the industry. And her selling 13 million records makes everyone kind of get excited again and start signing good acts and pushing good music out there and and stuff. And yeah, it's it's just a song like that. It's just to say like keep doing your own thing, and it will eventually break through. And you don't have to graduate from a Brit school to become a success. No, no, that that line wasn't so much a dig at the Brit school. It was more of a dig of people thinking that I went to Brit school. There was a time when I wrote that tune where people like Adele and Leona Lewis and the Kooks and who else? Image and Heat went there. Like all these people went to Brit school. And there was a Brits once where they all won Brits. And in the press, it was like young people, young musicians, Brit school, blah blah blah. And every time I do a gig. There'd be someone afterwards that'd be going, "Oh, you went to Brit school, didn't you?" And I'd be like, "No." So I put it in the song just to kind of make clear that people knew that I didn't. But it was never a dig at the Brit school. Is it true that your label wanted to change your appearance? I think it's better to look like a、uh, in in a management's eyes and a record company's eyes. The more the more marketable you are, features wise, the easier it is to market you. When actually nowadays people like people that look like themselves. Like Adele does not look like Beyonce. But she can sing like Beyonce, and that's why people, you know, she's just a normal person. She doesn't look too unattainable, if that if that makes sense. And I think they wanted me to kind of be a bit more boy band, a bit more model esque. But I think the fact that I'm not, and even though the album sold however many copies it sold, and we're selling out gigs and stuff, I can still wear the same hoodie every day and the same jeans every day, and kind of look like the kid next door that doesn't really wash. But I do wash. Ed. Did you really record this record plus in your garden shed? Yeah. It seems you created this sort of a lo-fi feel, except for the last song, which is really different. Yeah, that, well, that was done in the shed as well. Like,、oh. yeah. So, um, you know what? The second to last one was the only one that wasn't. The vocals were done there, but it, that that was kind of done more polished up in up in LA with a guy called No ID. Um, but um, we did the vocals in the shed. But、um, I'd done all my recordings in this shed in in Surrey, and it just didn't make sense to kind of go somewhere else. And you know, because Eighteen was already a hit by the time we we started making the album, and that was done in the shed like a year ago. So if that's good enough to get on radio the way it is, then why not record the whole album like it? Ed, I heard that you wrote the song "Wake Me Up" at Jamie Foxx's house in L.A. It was written there. It's 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 more about kind of like I wanted to write a love song that love songs nowadays. It's it's quite hard to write an original love song because it's usually kind of like you know, baby, this is the way I feel, or you know, my heart bleeds without you, and but all, all of that. And I kind of wanted to write a song that was a bit more blunt and a bit more kind of like the reason I'm in love with you is because we watch Shrek and we do this and I can I don't know play Xbox and I never win like that just to be kind of more straight to the point rather than. Because I've got a whole album of love songs that are a bit more subtle, so I just wanted to write a blunt one that was a bit straight to the point. I understand that Elton John has been very instrumental in your career as a mentor and a fan. How often do you keep in touch? Once every two weeks, maybe. Good. He's a he's a lovely guy, really really nice guy. Um, what makes him a fan? I think I think he's just excited about the. He's just excited about new music in general. Like he loves. New bands and new CDs, and he gets very excited when he likes an album. And thankfully, he likes my records, so he's kind of into it. And on my management, we have like James Blunt and Lily Allen as well, and he got very excited about them, and they did all right. So we're talking about what、uh, a three-year overnight success here. Four years. And if you were to do it all over, would you do anything differently? Nah, nah, because everything that I've done has shaped who I am today, and the music I play today, and the、uh, live act that you see today. That everything that's happened has done that.、Um, I wouldn't do anything differently. Ed, let me ask you: Has success changed your life? The only thing, nothing's changed apart from my time. So I've got the same friends, same family, live on the same sofa, eat the same food, wear the same clothes. Play bigger gigs. That's changed, I guess. Playing bigger gigs,、um, sell more records. That's changed.、Um, I can't really go out in public. That's changed, and I haven't got a lot of time. Were you surprised by reaching number one on the charts so soon?、Um, I'd like to say yes, but I wasn't too bothered about where it charted because 
um, in in England you can sell 30,000 and go to number one or you can sell 200,000 and go to number one and you know s selling 30,000 isn't like a amazing week to have and if I'd have gone number one and sold 30,000 you know it, it would have been good because I'd have gone number one but it wouldn't have been like you know uh, I, I, I wouldn't have been over the moon about it because the label kind of put pressure on me to sell a certain amount week one which was around 60,000 so when we sold 100,000 that's when I was happy and that's when I was surprised it wasn't about the chart position because you can sell different amounts and get to number one um, so chart positions don't really mean anything it's all about kind of sales so doing 100,000 week one was a very very nice thing to happen I was happy how much time if any do you spend on social media I probably spend an unhealthy amount of time on social networks, but only because I get bored on trains. Um, and I think things like Twitter are important because nowadays with uh, with albums and music, you can get it for free anywhere. Like I could go out now onto that computer and find 16 different download sites you could find this album on for free. So there's no pressure to not download it for free. For, for, for instance, because you're losing eight pounds buying an album, whereas where, where you could get it for free. So nowadays, the only reason someone's going to buy your album really is if there's a connection with you, if they feel like they know you, if they think you're a nice person and, and, and you deserve it. The, the, the amount of people that would say, oh, I bought your album because I saw this interview and you seemed all right. Or people who'd be like, I think you're a prick and that's why I downloaded it for free. Like there's those things. So social networking, things like Twitter, if your personality comes across on, on Twitter, however much you tweet. So um, if people feel like they know you and that you're a good person and you, know, you deserve their eight pounds, which is a weird way to look at music nowadays, but you know, that's, that's when they'll buy your record. So I think, I, I think it's more, more important to use social media nowadays. And I think the reason why I've had so much success is I have quite a loyal, loving fan base who every time I release something, they're like, fuck it, let's get it to number one. That's, that's what we, Ed, Ed deserves this. We saw Ed when he was playing to four people and Ed needs to go to number one with this. And that's why they'll support it. Whereas I know acts in England that have been going for years that were getting number ones 10 years ago or whatever, because their record was getting hammered on radio. And then they got Twitter and everyone's kind of like, yeah, they're a bit of a, bit of a cunt and, uh, you know, don't buy their shit anymore. Ed, I'm curious. Why did you cast Rupert Grint for the Lego House video? Are you a big Harry Potter fan? I am actually, yeah, but it was more it was more like I wanted to make a video where someone else played me that looked enough like me for people to believe that that was me, if that makes sense. Which is great because people all around the world now think that Rupert Grint's started off a music career and they're like, oh, have you heard Rupert Grint's new song? And people are like, no, it's actually, actually Ed, which is kind of my intention, so it's good. And one last question before we go. Who inspired you to pick up the guitar? It was uh, Eric Clapton. I saw him at the Queen's Jubilee on TV playing Layla. And I was like, that's a pretty cool riff. I want to learn that riff. And then I learned the riff. And then I was like, actually, it's quite a cool song. I want to learn the whole song. So I learned the whole song. And then I was into Green Day at the time. So I learned all the Green Day songs on guitar, which weren't too complicated. And then I got into Hendrix and played all the Hendrix songs. And then I got into Rory Gallagher and did all the Rory Gallagher songs. And it was, it, I, I just got very passionate about the guitar by watching other guitarists kind of do their thing but Damien Rice was the point where I bought an acoustic guitar and started doing the strummy thing Ed thanks for sharing your time with us thank, thank you, you so pleasure. much thank you again for listening to pop star conversations be sure to click the subscribe button below and hit the red bell so that you'll be notified of our next exclusive interview thank you again for listening thank you for listening to pop star conversations please join us again for another conversation with your favorite musical artist You're listening to Pop Star Conversations, taking you inside with your favorite musical artists. This week, Chuck and I are sitting here with one of the most famous guitarists in the world, Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. Welcome to the show. Keith, thanks for coming on the show. Why did it take so long for you to record this album, A Bigger Bang? It was. It's just amazing how long these things have been also from our point of view oh it was 
every tour is to do with a record, you know, but you don't realize that, oh, that, that's nearly eight years <laughs> gone by. You know, it's amazing, but it's true. And um, yeah, it is about time because the last tour and everything was, uh, it was great to do it, but it was basically retro, you know. I mean, I've, after all, that was what the record was about, you know, I mean, it's 40 licks and so you pay your dues and. Uh, and it was great fun in it, but we did miss having some new stuff to play, you know. I mean, and this time there's a sort of certain uh, anticipation in the air because we have, it's like, hey, you've got a f more ammo, <laughs> you know, fresh magazine, you know. <laughs> when did you all decide to get together on this project? Nick gave me a call last year and and I was kind of expecting it around that time because it's usually about 18 months after the end of a tour when you start to think about it you know and and obviously there's no, you know if we were going to go out on the road again then needed a new record or oh, vice versa we just wanted to make a new record actually you know and i mean the tour i mean they they, they the record and the tour has become inextricably sort of entwined together you know they get uh, it, it's, so at one point you think you're just making a record and then you realize no you're actually setting up also a world tour in conjunction with it and so it, these things you know even though i've been doing it for these years it only still slowly dawns on you that oh yes right okay yeah that's the whole deal okay <laughs> why did the stones put out four live albums in 10 years live albums are more uh, interesting i mean and you get a better sound today um and some live albums i mean musicians playing live is after all what it's about but at the same time no you can't do you know too many of them uh, it's uh recording live is it's one of those things if you record everything sometimes you find a really good uh, versions you know and you say oh well that's the reason you record live and then it's worth doing but it's not usually something we aim at doing, you know. We just record everything anyway. You know, and we record every show. <laughs> I really have to say, though, the Rolling Stones, their live shows, you guys are like a fine wine. You just get better with age. I think so. Yeah. I mean, in a way, maybe that's what is it is. I think between the band, they still say, well, you know, I could still do that. Well, I could do that better, you know. I mean, uh, we're still... The, the Rolling Stones are strange guys. I mean, in a way, they're looking for the Rolling Stones as well, you know, <laughs> whoever they are, you know, and we're trying to define them. They're, they're not definable, really, even to ourselves. You know, they keep changing on us. Uh, but in a way, I guess it's kind of just like when something takes off, you just hang on to the coattail and see where it goes, you know. It's an adventure. But honestly, only the greats get better. I've never really thought about that. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't think Duke Ellington or Count Basie did, but I mean, if you're talking about rock and roll bands, uh, yeah, most of them burn out early, yeah. Yeah, but then they don't have the conditioning that we do, you see. <laughs> they, miss, they miss a certain part of their training somewhere, and that's why they get worse. You know? This album title, A Bigger Bang, are you referring to the creation of the universe? Well, there's a hint of that, and uh, I, I suppose I didn't check the title. That to me, the title came. They said that's what they wanted to call the tour, and I thought, well, given you know the fact of the size of these tours, and the things we do, that seemed appropriate. And then they said, yeah, but we want to call the album a bigger bang too. And I was a little bit, a bit but then I realised, of course, that uh, as I say, these tours and these records get tied in together. And there was really, you know, there was, I would be really swimming upstream to, to have argued about it, so I left it alone. Although I don't think it's the best title for an album, but then if it's in conjunction with the tour, I think it kind of makes sense. And really the title of the album is what's inside that counts to me. <laughs> is, you know, is the music good, you know what I mean? Have you been delving into the Big Bang Theory? Yeah, yeah, I have done some on that, and uh, I tell you what, uh, I'll publish my results as soon as I've made up my mind, you know, <laughs> don't we all, you know, but whether it was a big bang or whether God just flung us here, who knows, I don't really care, you know, I mean, to me, I leave that to other people that study the universe all the time, I study people. Mm. This record has 16 tracks on it. You haven't had that many tracks on a record since Exile on Main Street, and that was in 72. It is, I believe. Yeah, that was pointed out the other day. Um, 
Well, no, there's no particular reason for that except that these were the the songs that we'd done up to now that were ready to go. We cut a lot more. But uh, these ones were ready to go, and we were saying, well, which ones do you want to leave off? And then there's technology to take into account, which you can actually do that. And you can put 16 tracks on a CD, whereas you couldn't on, a, on an old album. Yeah. Because the quality of sound would go. But uh, in the long run, we just decided to say, well, this is what we've done, let's put it all out and, do it and see, what, see what flies. Yeah. And this particular album, it covers all of the sounds and styles that, you know, the Rolling Stones are known for. I only realized that I, just a week or so, and Mick and I were talking when we were starting to listen to the whole thing and said, in a strange way, although we didn't plan it at all, uh, this covers like, pretty much all of the areas, you know. It was, uh, although at the time we didn't plan it that way. I mean, we don't say, well, now we need a fast one or a slow one, we need a rocker or we need, uh, we just cut the songs that we had, you know. Say, so, okay, this goes like this. And we were enjoying recording and, uh, and found out that we'd actually covered the bases pretty much without even uh, planning it. I like things when you don't have to plan them, because when you make plans, they never work, you know. No, it's quite amazing that the Rolling Stones are in their fifth decade. That is one heck of an accomplishment. I mean, I'm quite grateful, actually. You know? I mean, I'm still here, you know, and, and I'm doing what I want to do. I don't, I don't find anything scary about it, too. I find it all kind of adventurous, really. Uh, you know, especially at the beginning of these things. I mean, there's a buzz in the air, and uh, and after all, that's what I do. Yeah, it's. Uh, you know, I have no intention of retiring, and 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 all this is, uh, you know, when you when you're working with the right people, and I've always tried to make sure of that. Uh, it's always a fascinating thing. You never, you, I mean, it's like making a record. You don't know quite how it's going to turn out, and it's the same with the tour. So now, you know, we've got we're putting the stage together, and we're looking at it, and we're putting the songs together, and now we've got to put the songs together with the stage, and it's it's all a very fascinating process. You know, and uh, after all, there's hundreds of things to learn, the lighting, and you have to get involved in so many things that you kind of forget about every time. You think you just want to go up and play music, and then when you get here, and then you realize, oh, you have to worry about the surface of the stage, you know, what would it be like if it's wet? And you get into all of these sort of details, and it's just, it's interesting, you know, it's better than doing nothing, you know. And how is your relationship with Mick after all these years? Yeah, like all friends, yeah, we have, we have, I wouldn't say fight, I mean, we've never come to blows or anything like that, we, uh, but much less lately, I think we found that cooperation, and also, yeah, friends, I mean, I've known that man since he's four years old, you know, I mean, it's not surprising that we have ups and downs occasionally, and uh, when it comes down to it, everybody knows that uh, if you want to work together, then you want to cut that down to a minimum, and it's it's really not a it's not a point. Mick and I never think of fighting; it just happens occasionally. You know, there's just sort of something that crops up, and you go, "You're wrong." You know, what do you mean I'm wrong? And it's just like one of those spats you'd have with a brother or something like that. You know, you say, "Oh, go to your room" or something like that. Mm. And it's, uh, but because we are, I guess, people want to know about us, everything, every time we do have an argument, everybody talks about it. But uh, otherwise, you never hear about it. But uh, they always resolve. Mick was also knighted by the Queen. No, I thought it was pretty funny coming from Street Fighter Men. Uh, and given the fact that we both spent time in Her Majesty's uh, accommodations, you know, that, uh, and it never occurred to me, I uh, Mick that despised that kind of thing, so it kind of uh, threw me a little. And uh, apart from that, I mean, I just thought I, it was a, a kind of minor award. I thought they should have given him, I thought they should give him a peerage, quite honestly, you know, I thought they should have made him a lord or something. Uh, stick out for the peerage, mate, you know. Keith, I have to ask you, why haven't you put out a solo album since 1992? Yeah, just find the time, you know, I would, and if I could find the guys, I've, uh, the, actually I've spoke, seen the winos lately, uh, but you understand, I've got to say to a bunch of guys, we've all got different jobs, uh, you want to get together in 18 months, uh, and, and try and put it together it's finding the space it's both mostly logistics everybody would love to do it and so would i it's finding the time and the space you know really 
I mean, I, I probably will do it. Yeah. You know, I noticed that the Rolling Stones play in small theaters and they play stadiums and amphitheaters. Why do they switch between the sizes? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to keep it mixed up the same as last time uh, and maybe even a little more, hopefully. Yeah. It's, it certainly helps uh, our end of the things to play different sizes. If you get into the same, really the same big thing all the time, that can be, uh, you found that that can get more of a grind than if you know so one day you're playing an arena theater stadium or, or whatever it's it mixes it up it makes it far more interesting for the band you can do things on a small gig try things out and say well we can take that up to the big show uh, so you can kind of use each show as a, as a trial ground for everything you know yeah, this is an interesting question. What is the process of the Rolling Stones picking their uh, opening acts? Don't search. We just kind of listen around, and somebody will say, "You know, have you heard these guys? You know, these are interesting, or that you know, these guys are good live." You trying to trying to check. You know, you you say you might hear a record and say, "Oh, what about these guys?" And they well, they can't play live. You know, they're not very good on stage. But there's other bands. Uh, you know, so you look for you know guys that can play live you know i mean bands that like to play live you don't want to the uh, use somebody just because there's, they made one good record or something you know throughout the years can you give us some insight what is the recording process for the band when we started recording uh, it was in that very rapid uh, technology leaps that were going on from you know, we started our first record was cut on two track within a year we were, uh, we were working four track and this already makes a difference. And then within a, a year of that, it was eight track. Within six months, of it was 16. And then to 24 within, within a very short space of time. And so in a way, all of that was experiments because every time you add more tracks to the potential of recording, you're in an unknown area. You know, you're experimenting, in other words. You know, do you need that many tracks? And so you're you're always playing around with this new technology. You still are. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it it goes on and on. We don't use a studio anymore. For instance, we'll use a room maybe twice as big as this and have the machinery with the producer and the engineer inside in the room so everybody's hearing the same thing instead of having to go to a control room where they might be hearing something totally different to what the musicians are hearing in the studio. So we've got rid of that barrier, which helps a lot, you know, at least for a band like us. Keith, I'm curious, when you and Ronnie are on stage and you're playing live, how do you determine who plays which guitar part? Uh, we don't really. It's uh, we just feel it. It's, it's kind of intuition. Um, as I we call it the ancient form of weaving, <laughs> and uh, we and it's not necessarily the same every time we play a song. It's uh, there might be a nod and a wink. You know, where you swap over, but otherwise it just tends to follow itself. It's uh, when you play together with somebody this long, uh, you can do that. It's almost uh, you know, intu it's intuitive. It's uh, it's clairvoyant, in fact. <laughs> Sometimes a look, if necessary, but not often. Uh, even it's it's just by ear. You know, if I hear him going somewhere, I'll I'll back down under him, and if he's if he hears me starting to take off. He'll swap under me, so we just keep, you know, it's uh, symbiotic. <laughs> Keith, once again, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Keith, thanks for being on the show. It was a great honor. Thanks again for joining us at Popstar Conversations. Make sure that you click the subscribe button below and hit the bell so that you'll be notified when our next exclusive interview with upcoming artists like Beyonce, Cher, Molly Cyrus, and so many more are available. Thank you again for subscribing. Thank you for listening to Popstar Conversations. Please join us again for another conversation with your favorite musical artists.